Hello everybody. I would like to talk about wisdom in science and the introduction to the electric sun theory. In this talk, I would like to do a comparison between wisdom and knowledge. I will introduce you to a historical scientific case study of how wisdom come into play in scientific advancement and the introduction to the electric sun theory. We're going to a, a brief general overview of how electric sun uh, works in terms of concepts, but not going to much details in technical perspective. And then we follow by conclusion. First, we need to understand the difference between knowledge and wisdom. What we do in this world today in scientific community is called knowledge. The knowledge is information of which someone is aware and of course the knowledge is subjective. It's used for a specific purpose to solve some certain problems. And in terms of time the knowledge is subject to change due to new information that arise or new way to analyze the data and always seek for improvement. And of course, the way we obtain knowledge is from internet, from conventional education, and of course, the science itself. <coughs> On the other hand, wisdom is ability to make the right or correct judgment and decision. In order to do that, we have to understand the law of nature pretty well. And of course, the law of nature does not change with time, so it's timeless. And the source of wisdom we can obtain, um, in Buddhism, we call it vipassana meditation. And there's some other, other different ways to obtain wisdom as well. Let's, let's talk about a uh, really basic understanding of how a scientific theory is created. As we know from all of many textbooks, it starts with observation, then comes with hypothesis. With the hypothesis, we can create an experiment that actually tests what we believe a certain object works, and then we come into a conclusion. And of course, all of this is controlled by assumptions. Assumptions set what type of hypothesis we're going to use. Assumption also defines the experiments, how we're setting it up, as well as the conclusion. And if something goes wrong, people typically go to change hypothesis. Sometimes assumptions can remain the same. And of course, everything in, in this creation is based on perception. The view of such person create the way we observe the object. We can look at objects dif with different perceptions and we see different results. And the wisdom is the part of about understanding the whole process of how everything works and how everything is connected together and also aware that whatever we do is subject to each perceptions and is also bound by assumptions. And of course, when we look at one thing, you have one theory with different perception. You have theory number two, number three, and number four, and so forth. And of course, wisdom and knowledge are different. So knowledge is just part of the thing that we try to solve. So how do we know we have the right perceptions? If you want to solve the problem efficiently, of course, from the picture, this picture here, you can see that um, the objects can be viewed from different perception. It's like we're projecting the light into the objects and what we see from that shadow reflects 
uh, what object is from that perception. And of course, one perception may not be enough to understand the subject that we study. Of course, and the right, we need the right perceptions to efficiently solve the problem and the right perceptions will lead to the right intention, the right speech, right action, the right livelihood, right efforts, right mindfulness, and the right concentration. And this is one of the fundamental core of the Buddhism teaching called the Eightfold Path. So let's talk about the historical scientific case study. Uh, in this case, we study the Venus orbit. So as people already know how the orbits work, but at the old days, when we don't have much instruments, we look at the sky and see the star moving in the sky. And we have Earth as a, a point of observations. So it's quite straightforward to assume that Earth is the center of everything that's in the space. So in these cases, we assume the Earth is the center of the solar system. So it's a really a commonly accepted idea during that time. And of course, scientists that, that in the old day can make a really precise measurements of the Venus position surrounding the Earth over time and able to create a map of orbital paths of Venus. So the mathematicians are very smart, came up with a really complex equation to explain it. But of course, nobody else outside the society will understand what it means. So the problem become very complex and is highly confined to the object of study by itself. So by just shifting the perceptions, assuming that the sun, the earth is no longer a center of the rotation of the other objects and we use the sun instead, everything become simplified and all those um, theory of planetary orbits in the solar system can be applied not only from, for Venus but for other planets as well. So from here you can see the major point of inter uh, observation is that the problem can be solved by introducing an alternative perception, not, in, but not by sustaining the same perceptions or reinforcing it. The solution becomes simple and easy to understand by common people, you know, just like us. Uh, solution also be solved, can solve multiple problems at the same time, it solves other problems as well. So that's a good thing. And this is how the science should work, is, is in the efficient way. And of course, through the history of mankind, there are always a resistance to changes uh, or changing the perceptions of belief. And of course, that could cause um, slowdown in scientific advancement. Now, to be able to solve problem in generally and globally for this universe, we have to understand how the universe works and it works through the law of nature. So in this law of nature, I would like to introduce you to uh, the Buddha teaching called dependent origination. And there's a lot of details into this, but the main uh, conclusion is that Everything is interdependence. So interdependence causations, there are multiple causes and conditions of how things can occur. It doesn't occur by chance or random. If we know the cause and we can trace um, the all the factors that become something to occur, then we should be able to understand and make the right decision about that object. And of course, another teaching in Buddhism is called Three Marks of Existence. And this is very important 
it states that nothing can remain absolutely certain and subject to change. Or in the teaching, direct teaching is called impermanence. So if everything is in state of changing, even space, which a uh, scientific community assume is electrically neutral, is actually an impermanent state. So neutral is also impermanent. And since everything is ever changing, um, we call that suffering because it's it's it someday it's gonna dies down just like stars. All the planets someday has to die. And of course, if everything is changing all the time and it's dying and then it goes away, there'll be no self in it, or the concept called selflessness. And I can uh, compare this to one of the experiments in the electric sun theory later on. So in this case study, we'd like to introduce to electric sun theory. This theory is very useful in terms of making us, un us understand about the different perceptions in how we actually study the sun. And if you look at the sun uh, from this perspective, just like in this picture, you can see that it's actually a bright object in the sky. And a lot of questions will arise on what that thing really is, such as what powers the sun, where its energy comes from, and then leads to what trigger all those solar activities and when we understand this we can actually do some predictions and we know when the next eruption will be so perceptions is the thing that we actually want to emphasize because perception will define the direction of the solution to the problems and that's also ties to personal experience. If you are born really in the old ages uh, during the caveman period, we may think as something hot in the sky is really similar analogy to uh, a fire. You need the fuel to supply it and to keep it sustain the heat. And um, of course, newer we think of some nuclear scientists believe that the sun is a thermal nuclear reactor so it produces uh, not just heat but also radiation and of course if it, if it goes into a different perspective from electrical engineer perspective such as Nikola Tesla we think that um, of course the sun is driven by electric or the frequency and vibrations that actually govern the whole universe. So we have different perspective and concept of how we understand how that object work. So now let's take a look at the energy source that powers the sun. When we look at the sun, we see it as, uh, we can also see it as a living organism because it produces all the activities all the time. It doesn't seem to die down permanently. It comes and go. It has a cycle. And these cycles have different activities. So we have to raise the question such as where does energy come from <clears throat> that all power all these things? <clears throat> Is energy come from inside or energy come from the outside? In modern scientific communities typically have an impression that energy comes from inside the sun. But how do we know if that's actually true? If you look at our self, the body of our self is hot compared to the environment. And we see that it's all activities uh, come from human, you know, walking around, doing all kinds of things all the time. It has cycle as well, just like the sun. We have sleep cycle and activity cycles. And of course, we ask ourselves, where does energy come from, from this human? And of course, the answer, it does it actually come from inside the human 
by itself? You can say that the answer is no. We rely on air surrounding to keep sustaining um, the combustion inside, right? To create energy, we rely on food that comes from the in from the outside that we need to consume. So you need to consume something in order to generate energy. And of course, um, if we want to ask uh, some scientists about how the sun works, the easiest way to think of is this picture here that we have a, a heat coming from a gas stove, boiling water, really hot, so it's boiling hot, become bubble, and you got pop and all kinds of activity we see on the surface. And of course, um, in this, in this assumption is that the energy gradients is that the energy is the mo the hottest part will be from the inside and the most outside is the coolest or we can switch assumptions that energy actually powering the sun come from the outside um, through this experiment which I will show you later on so of course there's a consequence if you decide to think or to make a conclusion that energy come from inside the sun which is the theory that we conventionally use today and you can find that in Wikipedia the such assumption assume that energy come from inside the sun of course and it comes and the sun just appear here and live here for a long period of time and it's subject to decay of course I can agree with that um, but of course, if energy comes from inside, there's always being a decaying mode, so it's always dying. Um, and all those activities on the surface is some kind of chaotic, and it's a result of thermal convection from the inside. So some kind of energy propagate from the inside to the outside. Of course, by doing that, there's a consequence, and there's a lot of consequence as well, as we do a lot of research about the sun we have found a lot of unexplained phenomenon uh, based on such assumption such as missing neutrinos the rate of generation of neutrinos uh, is actually inversely proportional to sunspot and the generation is actually much less than calculated assuming the energy come from the inside the temperature of how like corona is 300 times the mass of the surface so the outside is hotter than the surface there's a road uh, the rotates faster at the equator on the surface so this is for the sun the solar wind accelerate upon leaving the sun the sunspot also reveal cooler interior of course because sunspot is black compared to its surrounding and sunspot travel faster than surrounding surface and there's a lot of long list that's going on as a consequence of using such assumptions but how do we actually solve problem more efficiently just like before we have to change the perception so we change the perception so that we look at if the sun energy come from the outside of course there's a lot of more problems such as if we use the same assumption is that why the sun's size remain constant if it should be actively decaying and we cannot explain that either or in other systems such as G Jenny the expansion and contraction of this object is so fast in the matter of days or months which is really hard to explain using a conventional uh, thermonuclear fusion physics so there's a lot of question can arise from try to enforce such assumption and of course creating problem afterward
if you ask astronauts about smell in space, he will say that it smells like arc welding torch repairing heavy equipment. So if you look at this energy source of arc welding, you can see the you can see that this equipment is powered by electric. So it's quite straightforward answer. If we look into the way we try to create nuclear fusion using a the device called tokamak, the way they create energy is that first they have to plug all this instrument into electrical outlets so that energy electrical energy can be used to create a microwave frequency creating vibration and causing plasma causing plasma generation inside this toroid uh, area volume so of course you can see electricity everywhere we do everywhere we try to do experiments relating to the Sun and other places as well so it's quite a common sense to use electricity to help explain a lot of things that's going on in space Of course, and uh, one of those uh, father, founding father of electric universe is Christine Berglund. Um, he used electricity to simulate um, the rings surrounding planets, just like the one in Saturn. Also, a lot of uh, activities representing solar activities, all using electricity to make this experiment happen. And of course, and the way to demonstrate that electricity can be used to generate a plasma sphere can be shown in this video. Uh, it's called Five Minute Fuser. You can do. You can see. You can find this in on YouTube. And I can just go through our video real quick. So in this video. We use electrostatic electricity, or in this case, we use high voltage uh, power to drive the electrodes inside the tube. And this tube is will be pumped out uh, so that it creates a vacuum environment similar to space. So there'll be less gas volume inside that's easy to create plasma. So watch this carefully. As you can see here, we have two electrodes, one connected to the ball, the other side is connected to a plate. As we pump the air out, the plasma ball start to create around the center of the sphere. And you can see that this is how you can create a plasma ball. And the reason we see the color, it is color is because the gas um, emit color differently in this case it's not hydrogen and as you can see it looks uh, spherical just like the Sun it seems like it's emitting energy coming out from the sphere and from here you can see that you can clearly say that the energy of this sphere does not come from inside the sphere for sure it come from the outside so if you or us as an observer at the Sun and we see a, a bright sphere in the sky we can't say that energy come from the sphere itself because everything else around us is invisible just like electricity in the air is invisible so you watch this one a little more careful you will start to see the change in the brightness of the sphere and you can see a lot of activities start to show up in this sphere and that's due to the composition or the charge density surrounding this sphere is different so you can see that the outside electrodes start to grow as well so everything works together as one system, just not not the sphere itself, but also the whole entire 
experiment. So when the vacuum density change, of course the brightness change and the activity change. So this is how we explain uh, externally driven sun. So in this case, if we compare that to uh, the real sun, we can see on the top picture on the on your right, you see some bright filament pointing out from the sun. It's just like the way it happened in fusion neutron generator in a similar fashion. And of course, uh, from this observation, we found that the energy did not come from inside the plasma spherical ball. And those plasma activities around the ball change due to external influences. And of course, we can clearly say that there's no self in this plasma ball. The plasma ball cannot sustain itself. It relies on energy from the surrounding to create it at the beginning. And of course, there's a process to sustain such thing. And if we take a look at how we compare that to solo minimum and maximum. This is just a possible explanation. Of course, it needs a lot more uh, study about it. During the high pressure time, we see a lot of activities as filaments like surrounding this plasma sphere ball compared to when it's low pressure. So the glow become more uniform. If you compare that to during the solar activity time, you see that um, uh, there's a lot of activities during uh, solar maximum, and there's not much uh, during solar minimum, even though the shapes remain really the same. So it looks like a solid object that we're actually studying. Of course, um, so this is just one explanation of how solar activity cycles work is that um, the, the solar activity cycles work because the way the sun interacts with its environment change periodically just like the world has um, the season which is due to the interaction between earth and the sun of course it's not just the earth by itself that has each season by, by its own but it's due to it, the interaction the same analogies go with the sun where we have 11 year cycle and we also have cycles of um, low activities than usual and that time resulting in uh, uh, mini ice age that occur in the past and that also explain that the energy around the, the earth also become less so it become cooler of course um, everything is subject to change because this is science but I would like to show this as a, an, an alternative explanation to the mainstream science that um, we can see things in a much simpler way and not too complicated to understand for general people. And of course, the conclusion is that um, the knowledge alone cannot help advancing science. The knowledge can help advance science, but it could be in a really incremental step but not a giant leaps in advancement because wisdom is required in any scientific developments to maintain a balanced view of the problem and to make the right research decision and there's much more that um, anyone can draw conclusion from this uh, based on our own wisdom thank you very much for listening